Welcome back to another episode of ASTR. Thanks so much to those of you who watch regularly and have let us know that you're enjoying the show. In this episode, the managing editor of the online Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists, Dr. Dragoslava Santrak, tells another inspiring story from the ESDA. Then Elizabeth Henry, our digital records manager, shares important information about how to use and search ASTR's online archive of Adventist historical documents, magazines, books, and other publications. At the end of this episode, Meredith Carter, editor of the annual statistical report, tells us about the vast number of languages in which the Seventh-day Adventist Church conducts its mission. But first, let's turn to the events of this week in Adventist history. On October 1st in 1860, the leaders of Sabbatarian former Millerites were meeting in Battle Creek, Michigan. For a number of years, the group had been edging closer towards formal organization. But, as a result of the way organized denominations had treated Millerites in the early 1840s, the ex-Millerites were very wary of any organization, on the basis that it was an example of Babylon. And of course, the second angel's message of Revelation 14 warns against Babylon, and in Revelation 18, God's people are called to come out of Babylon. So, the idea that organizing another denomination would be partaking of Babylon made Seventh-day Sabbath-keeping Adventists very cautious. Some believed that even choosing a name for themselves would make them Babylon. But starting in late 1853, James and Ellen White had urged their fellow Sabbatarians that some kind of organization was essential, and they had been joined in their appeals by leaders such as Joseph B. Frisbee, Joseph H. Wagoner, and Merritt E. Cornell. Frisbee proposed the name Church of God, but others, including James White, preferred Seventh-day Adventist, a name that had emerged in Michigan in the 1850s. In late September of 1860, a conference of leaders of the nascent Sabbatarian movement met in Battle Creek. But even after three days of discussion, they had been largely unable to reach agreement on moves towards organization. On September 30, when they were due to end the conference, Joseph Wagoner appealed to them to stay one day more, and they met at dawn on October 1st. Eventually, on that day, so the minutes of the conference record, the name Seventh-day Adventists was proposed as a simple name and one expressive of our faith and position. Following further discussion, David Hewitt, a delegate from Battle Creek, then offered the following resolution, resolved that we take the name of Seventh-day Adventists. But though the name was familiar, his motion aroused hostility. As the minutes record, this resolution was freely discussed. Opposition apparently focused on the wording of the motion that we take the name rather than the proposed name itself. Ezra A. Poole, a delegate from New York State, at this point offered an alternative wording. Hewitt withdrew his motion and Poole's was put, resolved that we call ourselves Seventh-day Adventists. The minutes record, after a somewhat lengthy discussion, the question was called for and the resolution adopted. Apparently, it was acceptable in the eyes of the organization skeptics for them to call themselves Seventh-day Adventists, but not to take the name of Seventh-day Adventists. It seems that the latter seemed too formal but that the former was informal enough to alleviate the qualms of the doubters. But in the end, the vote in favor was almost unanimous. All other Seventh-day Adventist organizational structure flows from that one decision. The following year in 1861, a number of local churches in Michigan formed the Michigan Conference. An example followed in 1862 
by Seventh-day Adventist congregations, and we can now call them Seventh-day Adventist, in several other states. Then, in May 1863, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists was established, marking the founding of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. That was this week in Adventist history. You can find research findings on many different topics relating to the Adventist Church at AdventistResearch.info. Sign up for the ASTR Research Newsletter, explore our blog, and read original research reports, all available at AdventistResearch.info. That's AdventistResearch.info. Today's story from the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists which can be freely accessed at encyclopedia.adventist.org, is about Eline Dumas-Lee, world-renowned Adventist lyric soprano soloist. Eline Dumas-Lee was born March 22, 1903, in Knoxville, Tennessee. Her mother, Clora Dumas, ensured that at an early age her promising daughter developed her musical abilities. By age eight, Eline was her local church's organist, and by 13, she had obtained a musical diploma and had begun teaching piano. Lee attended Oakwood Junior College, now Oakwood University, in the early 1920s. When her mother died in 1922, she dropped out of school and taught piano. Later, she earned a bachelor's in music from the Detroit Institute of Musical Arts and received additional training from masters in New York City, Germany, and France. Lee made her major debut as a lyric soprano soloist when she performed Handel's Messiah at the Detroit Art Institute Lecture Hall on November 17, 1948. After a move to Chicago in 1949, Lee's professional career was managed by concert promoter and manager Bertha Ott. In the summer of 1950, Lee was a co-winner with Theodore Letwin of the Michaels Memorial Award, the first African-American to receive the distinction. The awardees performed with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra on WGN Radio during the first broadcast performance of the Ravinia Festival. On October 26, 1952, Lee debuted at New York City's Town Hall. The New York Herald Tribune exclaimed that, and I quote, Eline Dumas Lee's performance is one of the most finished and exciting to be heard anywhere, end of quote. Over the next decade, Lee performed music by Bach, Mozart, Handel, as well as Negro spirituals in the great musical halls of Chicago, New York City, Los Angeles, London, Paris, and Rome. Lean performed on numerous occasions with renowned orchestras, including the Chicago Symphony Orchestra and the Philadelphia Orchestra. She appeared on television and radio across the United States. Reviews of Lee's performances appeared in the New York Times, Chicago Tribune, Washington Post, and Los Angeles Times. Chicago Tribune wrote that Lee has one of the genuinely beautiful voices of our time. The Indianapolis Star stated that Lee's name belongs in the same breath as that of Marian Anderson, who was one of the old-time greats. A lifelong Seventh-day Adventist, Lee was Oakwood College's first artist in residence from 1966 to 1970, while also a professor of voice in the music department. 
Throughout her life, she prolifically raised money for Seventh-day Adventist churches and programs and also performed at two general conf conference sessions. Chapel Records, an imprint of Pacific Press Publishing Association, produced two records of her performances, Eline Dumas Lee Soprano and Prayer, Praise and Power. Aline Dumas Lee died from a heart attack on March 30, 1970. That year, at the General Conference session in Atlantic City, New Jersey, she was one of those honored by a pause to pay respects to fellow workers who have fallen in the past quadrennium. I invite you to visit encyclopedia.adventist.org to read more inspiring stories about Adventists who made a difference in the church and in the world. Go to encyclopedia.adventist.org. In several past episodes of the ASCR video magazine, we have shared behind the scenes information on the contents of the online archives, including the digitizing process to make contents available and some of what's available on the site. Some viewers have mentioned that the information available might be somewhat overwhelming. Therefore, in this segment of the episode, we will go over how to navigate the website and how to search on the site. The online archive hosts over 95,000 periodical issues, sets of minutes, books, statistics, and audio files. There are three ways to start navigating the site. One, by clicking on the categories featured on the main page, books, meetings, or periodicals. Two, by using the options on the menu bar on the left. And three, by starting a search. Let's say, for example, one is interested in reading one of the periodicals on the website, such as the Review and Herald or the Records Magazine or the British Advent Messenger. Start by clicking on Periodicals. There will be a list of all the periodicals. Simply choose a periodical to see the issues uploaded. Select an issue to read. On the second column of the list, one can also see how many issues have been digitized and uploaded to the website. To return to the list of periodicals, click on the word periodical in the top left of the page. To return to the home page of the online archives, click on either the online archives in the menu bar or the online archives homes at the top right of the page. The navigation bar on the left gives a more comprehensive idea of what is on the site. Let's go over each menu item. The magazine and journals menu item contains links to the journal section, including to give just a few examples, Adventist Heritage, Andrews University Seminary Studies, the Journal of Asia Adventist Cemetery, and the Journal of Pacific Adventist History, a collection of Millerite periodicals, which are periodicals which were published before the Seventh-day Adventist Church was founded. One can also view all the periodicals with a shortcut to those that are most frequently visited. The next menu item links to the annual statistics reports, church manuals, yearbooks, and other statistical documents such as world church statistics by year. Under minutes, one can find organizational minutes, including many of the GC session minutes and transcripts. Did you know that ASTR has a quarterly newsletter and yearly archived journal? One can read issues of both the newsletter and the Journal of Events' archives, along with other publications through the menu item, Archives Publication. The next menu item contains papers from a variety of conferences and seminars. Adult Sabbath School Quarterlies contains the Adult Sabbath School Quarterlies from 2015 to as far back as 1888. The next few menu items are books, tracts and pamphlets, resources, which include a variety of papers, theses, and dissertations, summary booklets, and more, audio files, including the 1946 General Conference Session Report Audio, statistics, and images, which are photographs. Before we get to how to search on the website, let's talk about the catalog of the General Conference Archives and Reebok Memorial Library. 
the catalog is a convenient point of access intended to provide a broad overview of what can be found in our vaults and shelves, allowing researchers to get an idea of what is in the archives and library beyond what is on the online archives website, and to prepare for an in-person visit to the archives and library. To access the catalog, click on the word catalog on the menu bar. Okay, now that we have an idea of what's on the online archives website, how do we search on this site? To start a basic search, simply type in the term in the search box. For our example, we will use Spicer and click on the magnifying glass or press enter on your keyboard. In the search result page, one can see that there are about 13,000 results for the search term Spicer. The results include books, periodicals, and minutes. On the right-hand side of the page, there are year ranges. One can use these ranges to narrow the results. One can also use the drop-down menu to sort the results by relevance or by year. All the documents on this site have gone through optical character recognition, OCR. So one can search within a file. Click on one of the files in the search results to open the file and use the search tools either by using Control F keys on your keyboard or by clicking the magnifying glass and type in your search term. Click on the back button to return to the search results. To return searches in a specific result, for example, in books, for a search term, navigate to that section of the site and type the search into the search bar and press enter. The search result will only display items that are on that section of the website. One can also search for specific phrases by using quotation marks. For example, a search for William A. Spicer will return results for material with that phrase as written, around 500 results. If one types William Spicer, only 29 results are returned. The same search can be done inside of a periodical. So, if one searches for William A. Spicer within the Ministry periodical page, the search result will only return results from within that periodical. I hope this quick look at what is on the Online Archives website and how to search on this site will help you in your future visit to the Online Archives at documents.adventistarchives.org. Welcome to the latest statistical nugget from the ASDR data collection and publication team. In this episode's statistical nugget, we will look at the history of the languages table in the annual statistical report. Then we'll look at the most current report on the languages and dialects used in publications around the world within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In 1943, the number of printed and oral languages was listed in a table including years from 1921 to 1941, but there was no table listing the languages used in print. In the 1946 ASR, there appeared the first list of languages in which SDA publications have been or are being issued. In 1971, the table title read, Languages and Dialects in which SDA publications are now in print. In 1982, the column listing the division where the country was located was added to the table. For more than 20 years, ASDR sent out a table to each division with a column for the countries in their territory, a column for the languages with alternates and dialects, a column stating whether the language is being used orally and or in print, and a column for location. The divisions updated this list each year by adding new languages to it or taking out any languages that no longer apply. The ASR then included a list alphabetized by language or dialect as well as location of each language by country and division. Beginning in the 2016 ASR, the table was sorted by division. Then the languages were listed alphabetically together with the relevant country. Then, for the 2017, we removed reference to divisions and alphabetized the list by country first and then the languages that have publications within that country. Instead of emailing out the table to each division, we now use SurveyMonkey, which is an online survey software which allows us to export and analyze data quickly. 
In the 2022 ASR, we concluded that there were 276 languages and dialects used in publications, 288 used in broadcasts, and 443 used in oral work. We also know that there are 7,151 living languages in the world, according to ethnologue.com. For more information on world statistics of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, go to adventiststatistics.org. That's adventiststatistics.org. We're so glad you joined us for this latest episode of ASTR. If you've enjoyed it, Please like and subscribe on YouTube and tell your friends about it. And consider following us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. On Facebook, we're at Adventist Archives. On Twitter, at Advent Archives. And at Instagram, we're under Adventist Archives. Join us again next episode as we bring together the Adventist past and present in order to inspire for the future.